Hello everyone, my name is Shannon Prather, the Marketing Cultivator at GIS Inc. I'll be your moderator today. I'd like to thank you for joining us for today's webinar titled Map Mass, Mass PHI for Informed Decision Making. In today's webinar, we'll have speakers from both Esri and GIS Inc. GIS Inc. is proud to be a part of Esri's partner network as an Esri Platinum Partner. Our speakers will explore the importance of protecting PHI and remaining HIPAA compliant when it comes to sharing data externally. We'll demo a tool called MapMask that creates locationally representative point files for analysis while preserving the anonymity of patient health information and personal identifiable information. As a matter of engagement during the webinar, we'll pause for a moment to ask two polling questions to get a pulse on your priorities. I encourage you to answer these polling questions as well as post your own questions throughout the webinar. We'll respond to all questions at the end as time allows. After we answer questions and provide some closing statements, there will be a brief survey that will show up on your screen after I've finished speaking. Your time to answer this short survey is greatly appreciated. This webinar is being recorded and will be posted online. You'll receive a link to the recording via email. Without further delay, I'm excited to welcome our two presenters today. S.D. Garrity, Chief Medical Officer at Esri, and Lucas Green, Program Director at GIS Inc. SD heads Esri's worldwide health and human services practice as their chief medical officer. She's passionate about transforming organizations through a geographic approach. SD is the author of numerous health and GIS peer-reviewed papers and has lectured extensively on the world on a broad range of topics that include social determinants of health, open data, extreme change, homelessness, access to care, opiate addiction, pri privacy issues, public health preparedness. She has received her medical degree, master's degree in health informatics, and master's degree in public health from UC Davis. She is board certified in public health and is also a geographic information systems professional. Lucas Green has spent the past 20 years working in the GIS community and eight years with GIS Inc. working on DOD safety and risk management in GIS using geographic statistics and probability. His background in geography, math, and systems engineering has allowed him to lead development of Map Mask for GIS Inc. as a product manager. SD with Esri is going to get us started today. I hope you enjoy the webinar. SD. Thanks, Shannon. Hi, everyone. It is really a pleasure to be here today to talk about the relationship between HIPAA and geography. I'd like to start with an overview of HIPAA and why we actually care about this topic. And then I will get into some methods that you can use to comply with the law. When I finish, I'll turn it over to Lucas, who's going to walk you through some great tools that will inform your decision making as you navigate this issue. So to start, HIPAA stands for the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. This became law in 1996. And while this act does have several different parts to it, our focus for this conversation is around the privacy rule, which deals with the protection of individual level health data. Next. We call this data protected health information or PHI. Now the definition of PHI is any individually identifiable information that is created, used, disclosed or received by specific types of health organizations. So I really like the simple graphic that's shown here because I think it makes it pretty easy to determine if a data set has PHI. In order to be considered PHI, it has to include both identifier information about a person as well as health specific information. And of course, one very important identifier is a person's address. In fact, uh, location is a critical variable that um, bad actors or malicious people um, may use for successful re-identification attacks and resulting privacy breach. Next. But we really don't want to avoid using address data completely. I'm sure you've heard it said that a person's zip code is a more important predictor of their health and longevity than their genetic code. Well, that's going to give us a pretty good reason to want to use zip code or other address types of data in our health work. Next slide. And for those who are trying to improve population health, the more detailed the geographic information, the better. 
organizations often want to create policies or plan and prioritize community health initiatives using geography. They might geographically target interventions as a way to effectively allocate their resources where they're going to do the most good. And they'll certainly want to evaluate outcomes, maybe comparing one place to another or monitoring a single place over time. The level of geographic detail in a data set could actually be considered a measure of the quality or the usefulness of the data. Next, please. So it appears that we have a conundrum because as we apply techniques to anonymize data, we'll inevitably lose the detail in the data. I thought a gentleman by the name of Paul Ohm said it very well. He said, data can either be useful or perfectly anonymous, but never both. In other words, these two concepts are mutually exclusive. Next. So who exactly has to worry about the HIPAA privacy rule? Well, organizations that need to comply with this law are called covered entities, and they include health plans, healthcare providers, and healthcare clearinghouses, which are companies that may have access to protected health information or PHI in the billing or claims kinds of services that they provide. I think it's worth noting that while researchers are not covered entities by themselves, they are subject to the same requirements if they get access to PHI, either through their employment or through an institutional review board process where they received data from a covered entity. The responsibility for protecting PHI transfers with the data. Next. So HIPAA offers two strategies for de-identifying PHI, and we'll go through both of them. The first one is called safe harbor. Next. You might think of this process of de-identification like this. It's like driving a wedge or a barrier in between the health data and the identify, identifier so that they can't actually be put back together again. But obviously you wanna do this in a way that keeps the data, the data useful. Next slide. Okay, so back to safe harbor. Uh, this method, it, honestly, it might not be terribly useful, but it is simple. So safe harbor requires the removal of 18 types of identifiers from the data set to ensure that no one receiving it could establish the identity of an individual within that data set. Next. So these are the 18 safe harbor identifiers listed here from names and dates to all kinds of identification numbers to biometrics and full face photos. Importantly for this conversation is the listing of geography, which I'll get into uh, in more detail shortly. But first I do wanna give you guys a, a warning here. Blindly following safe harbor is truly inadequate for de-identification of your data. For example, let's say you have a data set with emergency department visits for an entire state and you diligently scrub out the 18 identifiers. You might think that the data set is de-identified, but what if that data set has a person's occupation listed as one of the variables? And what if one of the emergency department visits was for someone with the job title of governor? The point is every data set is different and it needs to be examined carefully to ensure that there aren't variables that could uniquely identify an individual. So even if you use safe harbor, you still need to think about the risk of re-identification. Next slide. So let's talk a little more about how safe harbor considers geography. Basically, expressing data at a state level is okay. If you go smaller than a state, you have two options. You can use three digit zip codes or any geography that has more than 20,000 people. Next. But consider this, while we do have some very large counties, for example, in the United States, more than 40% of counties are so small that they have fewer than 20,000 residents. In those cases, you could violate HIPAA by sharing county level data. 
Now, I live in California and we have eight of our 58 counties with small populations and I've listed them on the bottom of the slide. So maybe you're wondering, does that mean that every time you see a county level map that the privacy rule has been broken? Next slide. Happily, the answer is no, not necessarily. That's because we have the second de-identification method under HIPAA called expert determination. And this is where all of the flexibility of the law lies. The idea is that statistical principles can be applied in a way that makes the risk of re-identification very small. And uh, can you click so that my animation comes through on this slide? <laughs> Thank you. Um, so data that do meet these de-identification criteria are considered fully de-identified. They're no longer considered protected health information. And the US Department of Health and Human Services or HHS says that such de-identified data can be shared and used for any purpose. Next. Now this slide honestly just states the same thing, but it uses the official language of the privacy rule. And I just wanna draw your attention to the two statements in yellow. The first one acknowledges that the risk of figuring out someone's identity has to be very small. But notice that it doesn't require perfect anonymization. And secondly, there is a requirement that the expert not only determines the appropriate method of de-identification, but also assesses the risk for that method and documents it to justify their determination. If their assessment is not consistent with a very small risk, then the process is iterative and they got to start again and consider another method to move forward on. Next. So let's spend a few minutes talking about some common methods that people use to de-identify PHI under expert determination. Now the first method relies on the numerator rule. It can be helpful to know the heuristics or rules of thumb that some of our authoritative agencies use for their work. The numerator rule is about suppressing small cells and that suppression is a type of statistical disclosure control where certain values are hidden to protect the sensitive information. Now the CDC uses a numerator of less than 10 for their wonder database. In other words, if there were fewer than 10 observations in a geographic area, then they have to suppress the data in those areas to decrease the risk. The National Environmental Public Health Tracking Network is a little more liberal and only suppresses cells with fewer than six observations. And CMS, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, uses a numerator rule of 11. A review of many experts using the numerator rule showed a pretty wide range here from three to 40, but I would say that most of them fall in between 10 and 15 observations. Next. Well, what exactly does small cell suppression look like? Let's use the CMS rule of thumb for suppressing fewer than 11 observations. So that's really saying the same thing as less than or equal to 10 observations. The map on the left shows what the data would look like without any masking or suppression. The light yellow areas are still identifiable as areas that have 10 or fewer cases. So what you need to consider when you're doing suppression is complementary cells so that anyone looking at the data couldn't mathematically identify areas that have the small numbers. So now take a look at the map on the right and focus on the legend. The description of the lightest orange class has been modified so that instead of saying 11 to 39 observations per area, like in the first map, it simply shows less than 40. That way, the map reader can't tell where the cutoff was for the suppressed or cross-hatched areas. So again, when doing small cell suppression, be sure to think about complementary cells. Next. Now, some organizations don't use a numerator rule heuristic. They use a denominator rule. In other words, their underlying population for an area 
must reach, uh, must reach a certain uh, level or threshold before the data can be shared. Here's what some of the experts use. The National Center for Health Statistics uses 250,000. The National Environmental Health Tracking Network uses 100,000. And the Maine Integrated Youth Health Survey uses 5,000, but that's 5,000 youth. In the box here on the slide, I'm trying to show why this is so important with an example of how the risk for re-identifying your data can vary. So in the first scenario, it turns out that if you have a data set with a date of birth, a sex, and a five-digit zip code for a person, you would actually be able to identify that person 50% of the time. But if you change the date of birth to a year of birth and adjust the five-digit zip code to a three-digit zip code, you could only identify an individual 0.04% of the time. So denominators make a really big difference. Next. The way we deal with the denominator rule is with aggregation techniques. You can aggregate on any or multiple variables in your data set, such as age, racial or ethnic categories, uh, time periods like a month or year of diagnosis, and of course, geography. Now you can see an example of aggregation in the map where some adjacent polygons were combined until the populations in the area met a desired standard. The issue is that we don't want to always aggregate at a three-digit zip code because it's large and that three-digit zip code boundary type may have no meaning for our particular data set. It doesn't necessarily identify a community or maybe it doesn't fall under a certain policy authority. It's also well known that aggregating data in larger areas tends to mask disparities that may exist in a community or a neighborhood, and that ultimately decreases the utility of our analysis. Next. So we need better methods for aggregation than a three-digit zip code. So here you're seeing what it might look like to aggregate a point data set, that raw data on the left, using a fishnet grid or smaller political boundaries like census tracts, or even in the next uh, image, a hexagon grid. Now, Lucas is gonna also show you aggregation that's done by manipulating the latitude and longitude of a data set, or creating a tessellation grid of different sized triangles. There are many ways to aggregate data at smaller geographic levels while still maintaining privacy. Next. Blurring is another technique that can be used, and this one is based more on cartographic methods. This map is a choropleth or thematic map showing classes of data instead of specific data values. But you can go even a step further and transform those classes in your legend into ordered categories, like low, medium, or high. Or like in this example, you could have shown two categories of less than, or greater than the statewide percent. You can also combine multiple years of data in your infographic. Here they're showing three years combined for low birth weight babies born in South Carolina. There are several other cartographic techniques that blur your data, like heat mapping or hotspotting. Next, please. Another technique is a bit more complicated to perform. It's about perturbation or randomly offsetting your individual point data in a way that obfuscates the actual address locations, but still preserves the overall spatial pattern. Now you can see the example here in the map, and we call this method geomasking. And Lucas is also gonna show you a nifty way to do that easily. The big question of course is, how far do you have to move a point to ensure it's properly de-identified? Well, you can calculate a K statistic, which will inform your decision making. So there's actually health literature out there that offers suggested thresholds for K, and then your organization needs to decide what level of K is acceptable for their own needs. Next. Now before I end my comments, I wanted to share with you a few organizations that have really put some great thought into their processes. 
The first is the Institute for Families in Society in South Carolina. They've created this decision tree that allows them to employ either the numerator rule or the denominator rule in their de-identification process. And I know you can have the recording of uh, this presentation so you can study that in more detail if you like. Next slide. Similarly, the, uh, in California's Department of Healthcare Services, they've also created a decision tree. Uh, their rules require adherence to the numerator and the denominator conditions. So if a data set doesn't actually meet those conditions, then they go ahead and apply a scoring method that helps their users to aggregate data properly. And then, of course, once that's done, their method is still going to be assessed legally. It's compared to internal policies, and overall programmatic risk is reviewed. And if all is well, then the data are then considered de-identified. Next. So here's the scoring criteria that they use, which they borrowed from the Illinois Department of Public Health. Now, since there are endless possible variations uh, of variables in health data sets, they focused on the most commonly used ones like sex, age ranges, race, ethnicity, language spoken, geography, and dates. Now remember that their algorithm, uh, I didn't state it, but showed it on the last slide, requires a score of 12 or less to be properly um, de-identified. So Let's take an example. You could disaggregate your data by male and female. That would give you one point on this scale. You could use small uh, or narrow age ranges of one to two years. That's gonna give you seven points. And you could employ race groupings of white, Asian, and black for another three points. So now we're at 11 total points. That means that if we skip down to geography, we need to ensure that our areas have at least 20,001 population to proceed. But if we wanted to change it up and get to smaller geographies, which would cost us five points, we could simply increase our age cohorts to six to 10 years. Then we'd still be um, in the proper scoring criteria for uh, that data set. So this method would allow you to make trade-offs so that you can keep your most important variables as disaggregated as possible for your analysis. Hopefully uh, you can see how this works. So next we're going to just take a brief poll and Shannon is gonna lead, lead that polling question. Thanks, yep, you should all see it on your screen now. Um, the question is, does your organization have a standardized method for de-identification? Um, one option would be yes, it is published, yes, it is an internal document, no, or perhaps you're not sure. And we'll give you guys just a few seconds to submit those answers before we'll launch the results. All right, thank you all to the participated. We'll go ahead and close and share those results. Okay, well, that's uh, interesting. I think that um, it's great that at least a quarter of you have an internal document that you can rely on and uh, states your organizational uh, requirements and preferences. Um, and for those that don't have it or aren't sure, um, very glad uh, also that you made it to the webinar and hopefully the information that we discuss will help you help you to consider what kind of uh, tools would be appropriate for your organization um, so that you can have a process that you rely on. Um, so let's move on to the next slide. Okay, so I'm really just going to take a second here to mention 42 CFR Part 2. Um, maybe many of you have been hearing about this. I, I hear it a lot in the news lately. Um, this is part of the privacy law that's focused on drug and alcohol programs. And obviously we're hearing a lot about it because of the opioid crisis. Um, and basically uh, this kind of data is subject to HIPAA, absolutely. And 42 CFR part two has a lot of similarities with HIPAA, but there are differences. 
Um, and in fact, 42 CFR Part 2 has more restrictions than HIPAA. So I'm not going to get into any more detail about it, but if you are dealing with drug and alcohol programs, please be aware of this and be sure to review the law to ensure proper compliance uh, with that. Next, please. So for my remarks today, I did borrow heavily from a number of resources, and I wanted to take a moment to just share them with you. Um, please feel free to take a screenshot or review this later so you can dive into them yourself. Uh, they're pretty uh, accessible. Um, uh, I thought they were actually interesting reading, and they'll provide you with some detail that we just don't have time to cover in our hour here. Uh, but will help you again to form your strategies if you're one of the organizations that hasn't um, laid this down in, in governance policies yet. Next, please. So now I am uh, looking forward actually to turning it over to Lucas Green, and he's going to show you the map mask product that's going to make your life so much easier by providing tools that'll help you to accomplish aggregation and geomasking very quickly and with results that help you assess risk and justify your process. So Lucas, go ahead and take it, for, take it from here. Thank you, SD. It's uh, always a pleasure to have you uh, work with us on this. Uh, for those that heard my bi biography, I am not a medical expert. I'm more of a technical uh, math type person, and uh, we're always relying on experts like SD to help us out. So it's always a pleasure to have SD on here and always a pleasure to get any assistance she ever gives us. Okay, so with MapMask. So what does MapMask do? It basically, the main functionality we put in there is to take very discrete individual data points, as SD, you know, explained earlier, and try to anonymize the spatial location. It randomly distorts the data in a way that we try to preserve the patterns. So we use some statistical methods and just some random observation that moves the points around, but tries to preserve those central core patterns of clustering or current neighborhoods or other methods so that you still have the patterns. You could still maybe look at it and make policy decisions. You could be reactive to the data without knowing individual addresses associated with the data. We also support uh, some aggregation into bins. I'll show you that and we're going to be expanding that functionality in the future. And also, I would just want to stress, MapMask is your calculator. It's not an easy button to HIPAA compliance. As SD explained, you still got to document, you still got to know what you're doing and make the individual risk assessment for every, every data set that you decide to release or not release or aggregate. And uh, we try to make it quick for you to do that with technology but you're still responsible for making sure that it's done correctly. All right, we're gonna let Shannon do another polling question here real quick. Thanks, Lucas. Yep, polling question is on the screen. How often do you get requests for geospatial data? Once a month, three to five times a month, five or more, or perhaps it does not apply. Give everyone a few seconds before closing the poll. All right. Thank you for all those that participated. Okay. So let's go ahead and uh, move forward. Um, those are the results, um, you know, the purpose of what we want to try to do here is talk about how you can do it. And so uh, I know we're a little bit geospatial professional heavy on this webinar. Um, so uh, it'll be interesting to see uh, when we get to the end if some of you have actually used these methods before or not. Um, so let's go ahead and get back to the presentation. Okay. In privacy data, you really have two main risks. And now what we're talking about is the risk of de-identification. One that Esty kind of pointed out here is that um, you could always take a couple data sets and combine those together and then try to find um, 
other information about it. One of those may be you didn't pull out the governor as the occupation for the individual in the data set. Uh, this is really um, overkill to use K-anonymity on geospatially because once you start moving a point or aggregating data to a certain level, it becomes really hard to re-identify that individual unless it's just an extremely rural area. So really this method or approach, uh, studies have shown uh, K-anonymity um, really is overkill for a journalist attack. It'll definitely take care of it. However, you still have the issue of the, what's called the prosecutor attack. And what that is, is when the person attempting to get into this data already knows a little bit about it. They may know one or two individuals that are supposed to be in the data set, where they live, and they're gonna go in there and try to find them and find more data about them. This does become an issue geospatially, of course, when uh, say you know where somebody lives. So for example, um, let's say um, this is a da data of heart attacks. And let's say somebody knows I've had a heart attack and they know where I live. They may try to find other data about me in that data set, even though my name isn't explicitly in it. So they will try to go specifically to that location, to that point, and then try to find me. Well, what a KN anonymity statistic does is it gives you a score of the possibility of that happening. So let's say you move all the points around and we're gonna demo that. And the number of points that potentially end up closer to that data point than you could be confused for you. So it's how confused the data set is to somebody who knows a little bit something about the data. Um, in this particular case, six points ended up being closer. So there's a one in six possibility potentially of somebody grabbing that data and trying to figure out which one is me, which one is somebody else. Um, keep in mind the methods um, require them to already know something about the data. So it's not, um, the data is entirely anonymous to them. They already either know something about the data or know somebody that should be in the data set. So they already have some information. We do have several studies about this in our FAQ page at mapmass.com. I encourage you all to go to that and uh, look at our FAQ section and the links we have outlined there uh, that will take you to several studies that talk about K-anonymity. One thing I do want to point out, and I don't want to get into the deep statistics of it, you see the number five of K-anonymity thrown around a lot. Statistically, uh, depending on your data set, what this does is if you notice that black line, you end up with a very, very small chance of any records not being anonymized. And that is why I think a lot of people gravitate to that number. It's not the kill all perfect number. And in fact, in some data sets, you may not be able to anonymize everything to that level. But keep that in mind as you're reading various studies that somebody used five, somebody used six, you got to take a look at it and figure out what works for your particular data set. Uh, several use cases that can be used for uh, what I'm about ready to demo are research, HIV cases, um, software testing, uh, community grants and planning, uh, quality improvement measures in the community or the hospital or wherever. And it's not just PHI. It could be for any data you wish to anonymize. And this could be banking data, confidential clients. There can be a whole lot of methods and ways that um, you can take this data and do something with it. It doesn't necessarily have to be PHI. All right, I'm gonna switch over to the demo now. All right, so what you see here is the basic map mask. Um, hold on, something. All right, so what you're seeing now is the basic map mask um, uh, interface as part of ArcGIS Pro. To simply open up MapMask, it's an add-in on top of ArcGIS Pro. You come in here and you would open MapMask. Uh, we do have help in here. I do encourage you that if you do purchase MapMask and have an issue, please look at the help document. Um, that way um, you can sit there and you can look at it and uh, figure out things for yourself uh, and how we work and get some more references. When you open up MapMask, um, it just opens up as a side pane. 
and we're going to go through this. First off, we have our data. These are this is a homeless population in Austin, uh, and obviously not real data, but you can see there's significant clustering here. And if we turn on a heat map of this data, you, you'll see you got a pretty big strong band here. You got another strong band through here, and another strong band up through here. So. When you see that, um, keep that in mind as we anonymize data if we see those same bands going forward. All right, so let's turn our original data back on, our heat map off, and we're gonna pick the features we wanna use. So we're gonna pick our homeless data set. Uh, we'll talk about exclusion features in a minute, and we gotta tell the application what of the data we wanted to use. So maybe this is a large data set and we don't wanna use the whole thing. But for the purposes of this demo, we will go ahead and use the whole thing. And we're now we're going to use this k-mean neighbor. And we mentioned earlier that looking at it, trying to get a k-value of five or six may be good. We're going to be really conservative here and say use a k-value of 10. And we're going to try to make sure the average of the final distribution of the final points um, gets up above 10. So we're going to put 11 to 15 here. And I'll show you what this means in a statistical graph before we get done. So we're going to go ahead and see the statistics and process. And so this gives you the results. Let me go ahead and turn on what it actually did. And it moved the points all around. So if you notice down here where you don't have a lot of points in the south, it moved them a long distance to get that level of anonymity. However, in the downtown area of Austin where you had a lot of clusters, it doesn't have to move them as far to get that anonymous uh, location. So you can also see here, we ended up with an, aver an average K-score of 11, a little over 11. However, it looks like we do have one or two points that ended up with a zero, and we're gonna take a look at those here in a minute. Uh, say you didn't like this result, you could actually sit here and reprocess with the new random uh, generator every time. It's going to give you very similar results, but they will be different. Um, in this one, everything got at least a zero, a one or higher. So that's good. So um, that's a little bit maybe better processing based on the randomness. Now I'm going to zoom in here. One of the things that uh, we got an early complaint on is it puts points in the middle of water. Got it. Understood. So what we added was the ability to do an exclusion layer. Say you have areas, parks, water that you don't want the uh, don't want points to end up on. You can actually use an exclusion layer, and the layer I just turned on that's in uh, pink will allow you not to be able to use. Uh, it'll process it to where no points end up in there. Keep in mind, you can create an impossible scenario. I'm not going to run this right now because it takes about a minute to run, but I will go ahead and pull up the results of that from an earlier one. So let me go ahead and clear this and reset it. And you can see we have now have a slightly different data set. However, however, you can tell we still have some clustering and we still have some bands. In fact, if we open this up and turn it into a heat map real quick, you'll see that same general pattern being displayed. So we lost some of the band up here. It became a little more clustered uh, with the movement, uh, but as you can still see, you still see those general bands and you still see this downtown area still as a hot spot. So it's anonymized and move the data. It's not a perfect one for one, but it is better than saying, having to aggregate to the city level saying, I just have 200 cases. Now let's switch it back to the individual points to show you these statistics. So let's go ahead and open this up. And this is what we output. We strip any column data out of this. We pull any data to get out that uh, might have been in the original data set. You have a foreign key here back to the original data if you want to bring any of that other data, whether it be sex or age or those kind of things back in. Um, Let's just go ahead and show you real quick what I mean when we talk about K-scores. So if we open up the statistics on the final data, you'll see a distribution here of what the final K-scores were for individual points. Um, 
we got our above 12 here. Uh, however, most of our points are in the six to seven range. We do look like in the final data set we ran, have a couple points in that zero to one range. And you may want to go back and look at those and make a determination. So we went ahead and highlighted them. If we come back over to the table, we'll see that one of the points that moved the least, it only moved about 400 meters, has a K anonymity score of zero. And that's because if you look in the middle here, most of the points moved away from it, just randomly that happened. You may or may not decide if it's sufficiently moved or not, whether or not in that downtown area, half a kilometer is sufficient movement. That comes back down to your expert judgment. But we do give you the ability to look at that and see it. And you could also keep pushing that K up more and more and more. It's just gonna randomize your data more. And potentially make it less useful. I'm gonna move on now to a couple other methods. Um, let's switch back to our homeless data. And another method we use is rounding. Uh, so basically, we just obfuscate the last couple coordinates. So let me just show you what that looks like. So we have coordinate rounding and coordinate truncation. Basically, we're just gonna round the coordinates to a certain number of decimal places. And that's based on whatever coordinates are in your map here. So it's in uh, degrees, uh, decimal degrees down here. So we're gonna round that just to say to one decimal place and show you what that looks like. So it's gonna process it. Now this data itself doesn't appear to be that useful, right? Because if I turn off all the original data, your final data set is just a bunch of stacked points. But let's say we take this to two decimal places and process it again. It's gonna produce a grid similar to this. And then these points are stacked on top of each other. We didn't delete any as we went. So they're stacked on top of each other. And earlier when I exported this, I'll show you what this looks like when you do a heat map. Um, you still see much of the same uh, information here. And you'll see you still got your band up here and you still got the density down here. And it's because the points are stacked on top of each other. How useful that is um, for smaller areas, it's probably not very useful, but say you're analyzing something the size of the state of Texas or a large geography, this may be more useful than trying to just randomly move the points in all directions. Let's go ahead and turn that off. Go back to our original data set. Um, we also have something, and truncation works as sim similar to rounding. It just cuts it off at a certain number of decimal places and doesn't don't round it. So it's important to uh, know the difference between the two, but essentially both are going to give you a grid pattern of results. Coordinate obfuscation is a little bit different. In this, we just randomly move your points within a range you specify. So say your original data set wasn't helping, uh, or using K anonymity wasn't getting you there. And what we're gonna do here is just show you how you can put in the number of degrees and we're just gonna randomly move it. So let's zoom in and look at this. So using a negative 0.03 to 0.03, it's gonna pick a distance and direction between those in both coordinates, the X and Y, and just move it. Now, this is going to keep some of your clustering, but isn't statistically going to do it. However, you'll see the average distance this moved was two and a half, almost two and a half kilometers, and uh, with a minimum being 357. So you can play with this and say, well, that's more than I need. I don't need to move them that much for this data set, and reduce that and process it again, and it's going to move them less and bring them in. Like I said, it picks a random distance and direction within that range. So it's truly trying to randomize that data from its source location. I'm going to switch over now to our other tool, which is a bin analysis tool. Now, it's common. A lot of people have used uh, putting tools in bins before. Let me reset my data real quick. And basically, you just want to put these in bins. So let's pick the same point features again. We have triangles, squares, or hexagons. We're gonna do triangles first. And let's go ahead and put square miles in here. We want each triangle to be two square miles in area. 
Now let's go ahead and we're going to keep our empty bins for now so you can see what that looks like. And you just run it and it's going to create a grid of triangles on the screen and it's going to count how many points are in each one. So as you can see, keeping the zeros, some people like that, some people don't. To quickly get a better view of it, you can just come up here and do um, graduated colors and it's going to automatically draw colors to give you a better idea. But say you did this and you didn't want it. You say, you know what? My boss likes hexagons better. So I'm going to switch to hexagons. I'm going to remove the previous ones and he doesn't want to see all those zero cells in there. So you can do this and just run it again and it'll quickly grab the data for you and recreate that. It'll create the hexagons. You can come up here and do graduated colors. Now we haven't applied it yet, but one of the things we want to do is apply the denominator rule to this and actually count the census data underneath and let you know how much population is with each of those hexagons. So that way, if you have a denominator rule, you can decide if this meets it or not. So that's a quick rundown of the bin analysis tool. It'll do squares, hexagons, or triangles. It will make them as big or as small as you want them. Um, it won't let you make it bigger than the data set, obviously, but it'll allow you to have quite a bit of flexibility by just sliding the slider bar and deciding how big or small you want this data. Another thing I wanna show, and this isn't part of MapMass, but part of our pro, once you get this data situated the way you want it, you get approval to release it, it makes it really easy to just come up here and press share. And you can actually publish this to either your AGOL, AGOL account, a portal, or other web map interface that is supported by Esri to just quick, quickly push this data out there to either other agencies or researchers or to push it out to uh, the public if that's something that you're doing with the data set. So it allows you to get through this pretty quick to where a decision can be documented and made and shared out to the respective parties that need it. With that, I'm gonna stop and I'm gonna uh, switch over to some basic information that uh, a, about uh, map mass that you'll need to know if you decide to pursue it. Let me switch back over to the slides. All right, so if you're interested, want to know more, want to request even uh, maybe a demo for your, uh, for your agency, uh, go to mapmass.com. You can find all that information there. Uh, it's $1,500 per year. And it does include all updates. So we're gonna be updating this probably three or four times a year. So as we add more functionality, you get that as part of that original purchase price. Um, we all are currently soliciting feedback for, any, for our future releases. Uh, we do, uh, we're able to rapidly turn this around with the way we've structured it. So if you come to us and say we need something and we agree that it's a good functionality, we really would try to get it in for you. If you need more information, let us know. If you do need it in the on a server or in the cloud, let us know. We can help you put that together. Or if you want it customized to maybe the policy in your organization, we're capable of doing that too. But uh, out of the box uh, is the functionality we have now with uh, more functionality being added uh, actually as we speak. At this time, I'm gonna turn it over to Shannon for any questions you all might've asked. Thanks, Lucas. Yep, we have a few questions. And, um, you know, if you haven't submitted any yet, feel free to um, send those in now. We'll uh, get to as many as we can before we wrap up. Um, one question, um, and this answer is on our website, but um, do you need Esri's ArcGIS Pro to use MapMask? Yes, you do. It is an add in to Esri's ArcGIS Pro. If you don't already have Pro and want to make it a single purchase, we do have the ability with Esri to wrap it up into one purchase. Um, it, obviously, it'll be, it'll be more than 1500 but we can work with your organization and get you set up at one-stop shop with GIS Inc. Very good. Um, another question. Let's see, what ArcGIS Pro license level is required? The lowest level, I believe they call it basic, or I know they recently renamed some of them, but it's the lowest level of ArcGIS Pro. Very good. Um, are there currently any free trials available? 
That is a good question. Contact us. Um, we have made free trials available to some people. Uh, in general, um, we can make a free trial available, but we want to know uh, obviously more about you before we do that. Uh, but uh, we do consider free trials on a case by case basis. And I'll say the same for uh, Esri. You can go to our website or Google um, ArcGIS Pro trial so that you have that part of the equation as well. Very good. Um, what requests have you received thus far from industries other than healthcare? So uh, we've talked actually with a logistics company who has uh, a lot of customers. Um, we're currently talking to ba the banking industry. Obviously they have different rules than HIPAA about how they would wanna share their data, but there's an interest in the general commercial community of, for example, a company wants to share its clients with a marketing company, but doesn't wanna give it exact details of their clients, but still wants the marketing company to know where to target ads to. So um, there's an interest in the community there that is not as regulatory specific, more uh, protecting information of clients or protecting information of associates and partners. Very good. Um, I believe we've gotten to all the questions. If you guys have any other questions, feel free to submit them. Um, the contact information for our two speakers is on the screen now. Um, and I'll go ahead and make our final statements. Thank you so much for joining. Um, by next week, you'll receive an email with this webinar episode's recording link. Um, and as a final reminder, there'll be a few short survey questions that'll come up on the screen once I finish speaking. We greatly appreciate you taking the time to answer those. Thank you so much for joining and have a great rest of your day.